Um, it's great to be back uh, at the uh, GSB. Um, actually, I'll, I'll make a comment about this in, in, a, in a few moments, but my first experience with the uh, graduate school of business here at Stanford was actually attending uh, an entrepreneurship uh, conference as a speaker about 20 years ago, and I uh, have some fond memories from that. And so I, I, um, I'm glad to see that all of you are still attending what is still a very vital and, and important and useful event, and that's the entrepreneurship conference hosted by the business school here. Um, and while um, I would much prefer to have a conversation with you on the topic of how do you identify uh, a, a good entrepreneurial idea that be can become indeed a, a good entrepreneurial business, um, I, I'm going to leave ample time to do that, to use a Q&A to facilitate that conversation. Um, but first, uh, to provide a context, um, uh, what I'm going to do is use my experience uh, with Hyatt Legal Services and Hyatt Legal Plans uh, as a case study, if you will, uh, on the topic of identifying entrepreneurial opportunities. And while, in fact, uh, that, uh, that set of experiences is, in fact, ancient history, um, it is nonetheless, I think, important and useful in the same way that the whole case study methodology utilized in business schools around the world is useful, and that is for the universal principles that these experiences have, the universal principles applicable over time cross settings uh, to the particular subject, in this case, how do you identify an entrepreneurial opportunity? So let me start uh, by telling you a little bit about Hyatt Legal Services, which was founded in 1977 to provide high quality, conveniently available personal legal services in frequently needed legal areas at reasonable fees. I'm going to repeat that. Hyatt Legal Services was founded to provide high quality, conveniently available personal legal services in frequently needed legal areas at reasonable fees. Now that was our firm's mission statement. It was wordy like many mission statements, but it set the standards, it defined the product and market segment, and it shaped our marketing strategy. Now to the key to the concept of Hyatt Legal Services was accessibility. Our perception was that a large segment of the public in the United States was going without legal services even in situations when they knew they needed a lawyer for two fundamental reasons. They didn't know how to find a suitable lawyer for their particular type of legal problem and they either couldn't afford the cost and or certainly perceived that they couldn't afford the cost of obtaining legal services. The key therefore to our concept of accessibility really went to price. Uh, not only um, reasonable fees that middle income and lower middle income individuals could afford because what the legal profession was doing at that time was serving the wealthy through the traditional corporate law firms that have always served the wealthy. And there was some government funded legal aid for the poor. You, have to, you had to be very poor to qualify for access and that left about 70% in the middle who we believed were going without service and that was the segment that we sought uh, to serve. And we understood price to be the most important component. Again, not just reasonable fees, but also standard fees. Fees that were set in advance, never had been done ever before in the history of the legal profession. Fees set in advance, thereby eliminating the fear of the cost, which was the principal reason people didn't seek legal help even when they knew they needed it. And this might be difficult to grasp today, but back then, no matter what lawyer you went to and no matter what your problem, with only one exception, if it was an accident case, a lawyer would take it on what was called a contingent fee. They'd evaluate the case if they thought it was good enough, they'd go ahead and take it and they'd get their fee out as a large percentage of the ultimate reward. But except for accident cases, for all the basic legal needs that, that a typical middle income, lower middle income American family had, you would go to a lawyer and you'd say, I have this problem. And the lawyer would say, well, I think I can help you. And I'll need to do this, I'll need to write a letter, I'll need to make a call, I need to have a couple of meetings, you know, blah, blah, blah. And again, the setting was such that, you know, how you got to that lawyer was already kind of a complicated process, how you found it, ask friends, word of mouth, whatever, you go downtown, you miss work, you, whatever, you end up seeing this lawyer, and you'd say, well, what's it going to cost? And a lawyer would very honestly say, well, I, you know, well, well, first the lawyer would say, well, my fee is $100 an hour or $125 an hour. For the general practice of law, that was about the range back then. Now, you know, if you're a middle-income consumer, a, a working-class person, $100 an hour, $125 an hour is kind of a scary proposition. And when someone says that to you, there is only one question that crosses your mind, one and only one question. There's only one thing you want to know. What is it? How many hours? 
That's the only thing you care about, right? So if you aren't already put off and scared and frightened by the notion that something's going to cost $100 an hour, and the only thing you care about is how many hours, you're going to say, oh, well, how long is it going to take? And invariably, the lawyer would, quite honestly, by the way, answer, I don't know. Depends. Depends if it's three phone calls and two meetings. Depends if it's one phone call and six meetings. Depends if, we've got to, if I've got to write more than one letter. It de- I don't know. Now, most lawyers at that point were completely unaware of the fear that they just occasioned in the person on the other side of the desk. But those few who might notice that the person had turned pale, you know, would then say, well, look, you know, I, I really don't know. You have to understand I don't know. That's my honest answer. But it might take, I don't know, 10 or 20 hours. Without realizing that to a middle-income consumer, the difference between 10 and 20 hours at $100 an hour is a huge difference. I mean, that, didn't, that not only didn't solve the problem, it exacerbated it. So we set out to address that very problem by pricing legal services in a standard fashion, eliminating the fear of the cost. It had never been done before. And as a matter of fact, we were sued in several states by bar associations who believed it was unethical to charge standard fees. Again, we were sued by several bar associations because they didn't like the whole concept of price competition in the delivery of legal services. Um, but that was, price was not the only component of accessibility. Uh, we located Hyatt Legal Services offices out in major neighborhood shopping centers near where middle-income people lived and worked. We kept them open evenings and Saturdays so people didn't have to miss work and drive downtown and find a place to park and go into some bank building and go up to the 17th floor again, all of which was very prohibitive from beginning to end in, in the accessibility of legal services. Um, so our whole goal was to break down the barriers of anxiety that existed you know, um, between the public and the deliverer of the service. And that, of course, informed the advertising strategy that Linda alluded to in her introduction. <clears throat> um, high Legal Services is actually a classic example of perceiving and seizing opportunities to build something new. In our case, we perceive the opportunity as the result of a decision by the United States Supreme Court in 1977 holding unconstitutional the prohibition that existed in all 50 states against lawyer advertising. Um, the case had come up because two young lawyers in Tucson, Arizona, named Bates and Osteen, took out a little ad, a little tiny newspaper ad, said if you need help with divorce, wills, buying or selling a home, call Bates and Osteen. The Arizona Bar Association immediately moved against those two lawyers to discipline them and suspended them from the practice of law. They went into federal court filed a lawsuit, it found its way to the United States Supreme Court, and the United States Supreme Court said that there was a constitutional freedom of speech right to advertise legal services, and that if a bar association in a state had rules that prohibited that, those rules were unconstitutional. Well, that invalidated all 50 states' advertising rules, because there wasn't a single state that would have allowed that ad. And the bars, now, now the U.S. Supreme Court in that decision did what it always does. It limited its holding to the facts in front of it in that case. That's, that's the process of constitutional adjudication. And indeed, the court made that clear in a footnote where it said, this is about newspaper advertising. We reserve to another day the issues associated with radio or television or other forms of advertising. So what the bar associations and all 50 states did is they immediately passed new rules which were so limited, I used to go out and speak to this, and I'd say, if your name was Bates and Osteen, you can do that ad. Otherwise, you're still, everything was else was still prohibited, and it wasn't too far off from that. What they said is you can take you know, inch-by-inch newspaper advertising. You can only, you know, they really prescribed what you could do. So now, now the states all were in conformance with the dictate of the United States Supreme Court, but in the most limited possible way. They all still prohibited radio, television, and, and really a- any any useful kind of advertising. I presented the argument to the Ohio Ohio State Supreme Court in the fall of 1977, which led to Ohio becoming the first state in the nation to allow lawyers to advertise on television. And the argument was really, even though it was simple, it it didn't prevail in most states, but it had to go back up to the U.S. Supreme Court. But the, the argument was very simple. It was that the constitutional issues were exactly the same. The public had the need to know and the right to know about the costs and availability of legal services. And limiting it to, 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 to the least useful forms of communication made no sense in terms of meeting the public need to know and right to know. And lawyers, similarly, had a First Amendment commercial free speech right to advertise the co- their availability and the cost of legal services that they provide. And limiting that just to newspapers made no sense. Ohio bought that argument. Uh, as I say, all the rest of the states required the U.S. Supreme Court to tell them that that was the correct argument. So, again, what we saw was a public going totally unserved by the legal profession, 
and we saw an opportunity created by a Supreme Court decision to inform the public about where you could go to get certain kinds of legal services and what it would cost, which our perception was those were the reasons people weren't using legal services, including when they badly and critically needed them. Um, so at the time, with the general practice of law, there were lawyers who did this kind of work, but the general practice of law was essentially a very old-fashioned cottage industry. It was fragmented. A typical general practitioner practice alone was a sole practitioner or in a small law office of one, two, or three lawyers. There was no management or anything that anyone would recognize as management. There was no use of technology. There was, of course, no marketing, which was prohibited anyway. Uh, and most importantly, there was no linkage whatsoever uh, between supply and demand. There actually were a lot of lawyers, and there actually was this enormous unmet need. Now, when I was thinking about this idea of high legal services, I went out and I must have talked to about 50 general practice lawyers, and I'd share this idea. To a person, every single one said it was a lousy idea. Now, there were a lot of reasons. Bar associate will never let you advertise. Uh, you know, why do you want to be a storefront lawyer? You know, you could get a real job. You know, whatever it was, whatever it was, it was not a person thought it was a good idea. But, but interestingly, there was a theme to their objection to my entrepreneurial idea. And the theme was that the perception was wrong. I remember this very well when one lawyer said to me, you know, Joel, your whole idea is premised on the notion that there's this vast unmet need for legal services. Well, let me tell you something. My anxiety in life, I go home every night, and when I'm not sleeping, it's because I worry about where is my next client coming from. So I'll tell you what. When you go out and meet that vast unmet need, send him here. And he, I mean, he actually thought that all that made sense. There was no linkage between supply and demand. That we saw as a fundamental opportunity to build an, an entirely new kind of law firm, indeed a whole new delivery system that would link the unmet need with the supply. Now, I would, I would interrupt, because this is where one, I think one of the most important universal principles can be applied. Uh, I'd interrupt to say that entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial opportunities are often created by regulatory changes. Um, and, and my best example, my favorite example of this, actually, uh, I learned 20 years ago when, as I said, I came to a, I was based in the Midwest, and I came out to a Stanford Entrepreneurship Conference. At the time, they held them on Saturday, and they invited the speakers to come to a cocktail party Friday night, which I did. And at the cocktail party, I met this remarkable guy named Bill McGowan, since deceased. Bill McGowan founded a company called MCI. Now, this was before MCI was bought by WorldCom, and all those people went to jail. This was, this was Bill McGowan who started MCI with the idea that if you could bust open ATT's monopoly in the provision of long distance legal services, long distance, not legal services, telephone services, long distance phone calls, if you could bust open ATT's monopoly, you could build a business which would provide a better service at a much lower cost. That was his entrepreneurial idea. The only problem was ATT had a government granted monopoly. Bill McGowan set up this little office in Washington, D.C., basically alone. And he set out to bust open ATT's monopoly. He challenged him in the courts, challenged him in Congress, challenged him in the FCC and the regulatory agencies. Um, and it took 10 years, 10 years it took him to, in fact, bust open ATT's monopoly and start MCI, which became an enormously successful company. He said to me that night, never forgot it, he said, you know, he said, most everybody thought I was really an idiot. People would say to me, Bill, how could you spend... 10 years in this little cubby hole of an office with a wild ass dream that everybody thought was nuts, like you're going to bust open ATT's government grant and monopoly that's, been, that's existed since practically the United States started. It was nuts. And you know, they really, they all thought I was an idiot, but they missed, they, they missed something really quite essential. I didn't think it was going to take 10 years. I thought it was going to happen tomorrow. And by the way, I love that both as an example of Opportunities created by regulatory change and also about what entrepreneurship's all about. He thought it was going to happen tomorrow. His tomorrow took 10 years, but he stuck it out. Um, and by the way, I would, I would also comment that entre entrepreneurial opportunities will continue as we go forward. It's going to be found in the midst of regulatory change. And as private sector uh, innovation uh, is unleashed to address you know, public needs, whether it's education, whether it's health care, 
again, regulatory change creates entrepreneurial opportunities. Um, in our case, we seized opportunities created by regulatory change. I told you first was the Supreme Court decision. At exactly the same time and totally coincidentally, in the very same year, the Tax Reform Act of 1977, passed by Congress, um, gave to the provision of legal services by employers the same preferential tax treatment that employers had in providing health care to, to employees. That was a big development which opened up the possibility that you could work with employers in providing legal services the same way as they provided health care. Um, again, these are judicial, legislative actions, regulatory actions, in our case combined with a large market being inefficiently and poorly served by a Neanderthal profession, and that created the opportunity to build Hyatt Legal Services. And at its height, Hyatt Legal Services had uh, over 200 offices and over 1,000 lawyers. But to fulfill uh, the mission of the firm, uh, we always believed uh, that we needed to institutionalize a process whereby hundreds of thousands and millions of people would be able to gain access to legal services far more conveniently and affordably than the Hyatt Legal Services delivery system that we built enabled. Uh, and here a model did exist, and I already referred to it. The model here was health care. Uh, in the United States, unlike all other industrial societies in the world, in the United States, if you had, and frankly today, if you have health care, it is because it is a benefit of your employment. That's how American citizens get health care. They work somewhere that provides it. And we use that as a model for, well, why don't we figure out how to get people legal care using that same model? So we studied how did that happen? How did it happen that people got health care as a fringe benefit of employment? And the answer was it came through collective bargaining. It was unions using their clout at the negotiating table to get management of, of companies and indeed whole industries to agree to fund the provision of medical of health care to the union members employed in the particular company or industry. So we set out to make legal care an employee benefit by starting with unions. We started calling on unions and talking with them about the unmet legal needs of their members and in the context both of, of the personal and, and work-related damages that those unmet legal needs occasioned. And um, we started with our Hyatt Legal Services regional delivery capabilities. So in Northeast Ohio, we had 10 offices in Cleveland, Akron, and Canton, and we negotiated with the uh, grocery store retail clerks and with the meat packers who worked in the, in the grocery stores butcher shops and they went to the collective bargaining table with the grocery store chains and they got funded a legal care plan for northeastern Ohio and we had our ten offices and when a, when, when a union member working in any of the large grocery store chains in northeastern Ohio had a legal problem he or she could go to Hyatt Legal Services and get that problem addressed under an employer funded legal plan negotiated through collective bargaining. Um, as that concept grew we realized that we would, we would be negotiating for a contract where the covered employees were in areas where we didn't have Hyatt Legal Services offices and perhaps weren't likely to have Hyatt Legal Services offices. So we had to meet that delivery challenge, which we did, again, by the way, by copying the health care model, by creating a panel of participating law firms who, under contract to us, would deliver the covered legal services to the eligible plan participants in their particular community. And then we started getting national accounts, uh, and indeed we started growing the panel of participating law firms to a point where it was over 3,000 law firms in every one of the 50 states. Indeed, in any county in the United States that had a population of 50,000 or more, we had at least one law firm available to deliver the covered legal services. We started landing national accounts like PepsiCo and American Express and ATT to whose employees we managed the delivery of legal care under their employee benefits programs. And we seized on a trend in corporate America in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, moving toward cafeteria plans and flexible benefit programs. Um, the way employee benefits used to work was a company like PepsiCo would just say, here's what, we, here's what you have. You have this medical plan, and maybe you have this dental plan, and those are your benefits. And then companies realized, as, as there were as there were two spouses working in different companies and they realized there was lots of redundancy, both companies were giving each spouse the same plan and they didn't need that redundancy and they wanted and, and the costs of health care were soaring and running away. There was all these pressure on companies to figure out how to control the cost of their employee benefits. This started happening about the mid to late 80s. 
And so companies like PepsiCo and American Express changed the whole structure of how they did that. PepsiCo would say, look, we're going to give, we're going to pay your salary, plus we're going to provide $5,000 for your employee benefits. Here are 11 programs. Here's the cost of each of them. Here's a medical, a dental, a vision, a whatever. And you pick and choose the programs you or your family want and need. If you go over $5,000, we'll process that as a salary deduction, but we'll pay for the first $5,000. Well, in that environment, it became much easier to add a legal plan. Because what PepsiCo would say after we persuaded them that lots of their employees were missing work and, and getting lots of problems because of their unmet legal needs, PepsiCo would add a legal plan to the employee benefits offered. And the next year they'd say, we're going to pay you $5,000 of employee benefits. Here's 12 programs. We've added a new legal services plan. And if your family wants or needs it, here's the cost of that, and that will we'll pay up to the first 5000 In an environment of flexible benefits and cafeteria plans, it made it much easier for us to add the legal services component. And we ended up building in the legal arena uh, the functional equivalent of the PPO, or the preferred pr provider organization model uh, in the healthcare field. Um, in the summer of 1990, we took what was then the legal plans department of Hyatt Legal Services, and we spun it out into a separate corporate entity called Hyatt Legal Plans. Now, the principal purpose in our doing that was to accomplish something, a, a term actually, I didn't know this term until I started teaching here at, at Stanford, but, it was, it, but what we were trying to accomplish was a harvest opportunity. Um, that's what it's called in business school text. The idea is, you know, how can you realize the value that you've created uh, in, in, in a business? Well. The rules, when it was part of Hyatt Legal Services, we wouldn't be able to ever realize its value. And, and the reason for that is, then and now, law firms can only be owned by the lawyers who work within them. You can't take a law firm public. You can't sell a law firm to Sears Roebuck. You can't have passive investors. You can't even have passive lawyer investors. The law firm, under regulations governing practice of law, can only be owned by the lawyers who work within the law firm. So there was no way to. For example, access to capital markets, you know, sell high at legal plans. However, we looked and saw, well, there are all kinds of employee benefit pro companies that are public and that are owned by, you know, large insurance companies, and they're and they their employee benefits dealing with everything you can imagine: that vision, dental, health, mental health, whatever. So we spun out a separate corporate entity, Hyatt Legal Plans, is in the business of marketing and administering an employee benefit program. In this case legal plans. It didn't practice law, that's what the lawyers did. And indeed, a few years later, we sold that company, uh, Hyatt Legal Plans, to MetLife uh, in 1997. At the time we sold it to MetLife, there were a little over a million people covered under our various group legal plans. And again, these were em employees of companies like General Motors and American Express and ATT and Caterpillar and, and PepsiCo. Now, high legal services and Hyatt Legal Plans were different businesses. The same mission, very much so, but very different business and marketing plans and ultimately very different delivery systems. Hyatt Legal Services mass marketed to consumers, principally using television. Um, Hyatt Legal Plans used, you know, face-to-face -face sales to corporate HR executives or chief operating officers, very different selling prop and marketing proposition. Hyatt Legal Services revenues came from clients paying out of their pockets, uh, and it had a very low average ticket. I mean, the, the, this was a service for lower middle income individuals and families, had very little disposable income, none of that disposable income, did anybody have any desire to go to lawyers. I mean, this was a tough, low ticket consumer business. Hyatt Legal Plans, on the other hand, Rev there, the revenues there were based on what we only internally affectionately called tape and a check. You know, General Motors would send us at the you know, just before the first of the month, uh, a, a, an electronic list of here are all the eligible employees this month, and they actually wouldn't send a check. We liked the phrase tape and a check. They'd wire the funds on the first day of the month, and we got paid X dollars, depending on what legal services were covered under the particular plan, X dollars per month for every eligible employee. Very different revenue model. Um, uh, delivery of services. Hyatt Legal Services delivered through a wholly owned operation. We owned all the Hyatt offices. All the lawyers were our employees. Hyatt Legal Plans delivered services through contractual relationships uh, with other law firms who were the providers. Same market opportunity, very different business, 
and marketing plans. And very different results. Um, 1991 was the first full year that both of those entities ran as separate firms. Um, and I remember very well getting the financial statements uh, for 1991. Um, Hyatt Legal Services had, at the time, as I said, they paid rent in over 200 locations. It had about 1,500 employees. It had a marketing advertising budget of about $5 million a year. Um, Hyatt Legal Plans, conversely, paid rent in one location. In its first full year, I think it had about 45 or 50 employees. It had an advertising budget of about $100,000. Um, and as you might imagine, uh, the bottom lines were quite different. Um, again, coincidentally, roughly the same revenues in their first full year. Hyatt Legal Services was roughly break even. Uh, Hyatt Legal Plans was generating gross margins of 50%, and uh, EBITDA is a percentage of revenues of 25%. And I remember very well looking at the year end financials for both, both, both of these entities saying, Wow, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize this is a really good business and this is a really tough one. And as a consequence, we changed our strategy to devote all of our you know, major resources toward the incredible growth opportunity that we saw in a really good business model associated with high legal plans. And we started spinning off our law offices to our employees, to our managing attorneys, our regional partners, so they could own their law practices in their city and remain part of the delivery system for Hyatt Legal Plans. And in 1997, at the time that we sold Hyatt Legal Plans to MetLife, uh, EBITDA as a percentage of revenue had grown from that 25% in its first year to 38%, and that was as a result of our strategy of being the high quality provider in the legal plans field. But the important point that I want to make here is that Hyatt Legal Plans would not have happened without Hyatt Legal Services. It's very important to understand this. Things do not always develop as planned, and flexibility in approach, in business model approach, in marketing plan approach, in delivery system approach, flexibility is very important. I could regale you for the rest of the day with stories on this. I'll just tell you one. There was an entrepreneur uh, uh, out of Cleveland, Ohio, where we were building uh, high legal services and high legal plans, and he had been enormously successful as a guy who could buy troubled banks and figure out how to clean up their bad loans and this and that and make a lot of money flipping them two or three years later. And he'd done this two or three times and made hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, he bought a bank called Maryland Bank of North America, and this was going to be his third or fourth you know, gig doing the same kind of trick. And it turned out, well, you know, maybe his due diligence wasn't good enough or maybe, they, maybe he just didn't quite realize how bad it was. And it turns out this bank wasn't going to be saved. This bank was beyond saving. And so whatever he, he had put in to do this deal was going to get lost. And they had one little piece of the business that was making money, and the rest of the bank was a disaster. The little piece of business was making money had nothing to do with why he bought it. He bought it to fix the bank like he had done two or three times before. The little piece that was making money was a credit card operation. Well, when all the rest of it went south, he tried to sell the credit card operation. No one would pay his price. And so he decided, well, we're going to build this credit card, op credit card operation because it's a nice little piece of profitable business. And it, that, that became known M as MBNA, Maryland Bank of North America. He just shortened it all to MBNA. And MBNA went in a matter of five years from being this tiny little thing that he didn't even know when he bought the bank it had to a company that, by the way, was fairly recently sold to uh, Bank of America for something like $30 billion. And this guy, who was already known to be this genius financier and a very wealthy guy, made so much more on that than on all of his bank deals combined. It wasn't even funny. Everybody thought he was a genius. And he didn't even know he was buying that thing when he bought it. Um, so flexibility, very important. Um, I happen to believe that so is um, believing in what you're marketing. I, I think that is a very important ingredient in identifying entrepreneurial opportunities. Um, uh, my passion was making legal services available to a large segment of the public that was going unserved. I mean, I didn't start that off as an entrepreneur. I'd never heard that word at the time, and I certainly, if I'd heard it, wouldn't know how to spell it. Um, uh, I, I wanted to make the world safe for democracy. I mean, it was all about zeal and idealism and what have you. I mean, I remember very well when I became an entrepreneur. That was when we were losing $75,000 a month, and we had about a month left to stay in business. I realized you better figure out how to run a business. But, but the, the point I'm making is I was very passionate, and so were, it was the whole team that we built about the service that we were offering. We truly believed in it. Now, 
I will tell you it's a minority view in business schools, here or anywhere else, that that's an important ingredient. Most business school professors will tell you that the passion for making money is a driving factor. And it doesn't matter what the widget is you sell, it doesn't matter what you manufacture, it doesn't matter what your service is, because what's driving the managers is the, is the passion of making money. I actually don't believe that that is good enough. And I'll tell you why I don't believe it's good enough. Uh, because the going's going to get tough. In starting any new business, the going is going to, going to get tough in ways that, no matter how smart you are, you cannot anticipate. They're not in your business plan. You never saw it coming. It gets difficult. It gets tough. It's always unexpected. And the question is, are you going to gut your way through that or not? Well, you know, if it's just about making money, I'll tell you, if I'm an investor, if I'm an investor, I know that you're not. You're going to say, I didn't sign up for this. You know, this, is one, this is one I bought. I'm leaving, I'm going back to McKinsey, or I'll go look for my next new business to start, or whatever it is my opportunity in life is. Now, I'm the investor, I'm all out. But if your passion was for what it is you were doing, you will figure out how to get through that. And by the way, by the way, the sound financial decision may have been, that's it, folks, didn't sign up for this, this has gotten ugly, I'm out of here, sorry it didn't work out. That might be the sound financial decision. But you know, if I'm an investor, I want to invest in someone who believes in what he or she is doing. To me, that is a, a and, and, and again, I could regale you in stories on this. My first year here teaching, I had a wonderful five years teaching here. My first year teaching, a couple of young students were starting a search fund, and they were looking for their last sort of investor to put a little money in so that they could then spend a year to find some company. And I, I thought I'd do that. I liked the, the two young people, and I thought I'd learn something from this process of a search fund. And so I did. And then they started sort of, you know, emailing me with regular updates about their search to buy a little company. And the first thing that they sent about all excited that they'd found an opportunity was about a, um, a portable toilet business, porta potty business. And there gets a long email, all the economics and all the this, and we can buy it for this, and we can this, we can that. And I'm sitting there thinking, they're going to go into the porta potty business. I mean, what are they going to tell their mothers? <laughs> I mean, what are you going to tell your friends? I mean, I sell portable toilets for a living, you know? And I just couldn't imagine. I wrote them an email and I said, well, you know, the, the economics seem pretty good, but do you think you're going to, like, have fun and find yourself fulfilled having put out more portable toilets to the world? And I just couldn't, I just couldn't fathom that people were going to spend their life doing that. And so, look, what, what, you know, why do I think this matters? I told you because they're going a little tough, but the other perspective is I think you really need to and certainly should want to uh, be happy about what you're doing. You know, what environment will your entrepreneurial opportunity put you in? Here's what I mean by that. Who will your suppliers be? Who will your customers be? Who will your employees be? You know, the type of business, you know, it, it, it informs all of that. Who are you going to hang around with from when you get up in the morning to when you go to sleep at night? I loved bragging about what I was doing. I just couldn't imagine getting up in the morning to go seed the world with more portable toilets. Um, and, and I guess the point I'd make here is, you know, remember that if you're going to pursue any entrepreneurial opportunity, whatever it is, it, it will be your whole life. I mean, that's really the important difference about being an entrepreneur. Nothing is more all-consuming than owning a business. Absolutely nothing. Um, when we started, um, our business had, had no perfect role model. Um, we could learn bits and pieces uh, from relevant industries or companies, and we certainly tried to do that as best we could. But for the most part, in building high legal services, we were creating entirely from scratch. Now, another way to identify opportunities is by following the leader with the conviction that you can do better. Now, this difference is sometimes described in the literature as a brave new world versus faster, better, cheaper. Um, both have lots of examples of creating terrific businesses. I'll give you two quick examples of follow the leader. Um, High Legal Services early on uh, had it forged a relationship with H&R Block, which was very useful to us. I learned a lot about H&R Block. It was an amazing company that really owned the business of income tax preparation, still does. Um, it, it was amazing the market share that it had. I mean, if, if of people who did not prepare their own returns, people who went to, to get someone else to prepare their return, H&R Box, you know, had, 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 had an enormous percentage of that market. It was a phenomenally profitable company. Well, along comes some company uh, called Jackson Hewitt, and they're going to go into the tax return prep business. Even though everybody, the brand of H&R Block, they were ubiquitous. They had 8,000 offices all across the United States. I mean, how you were going to compete with 
with H&R Block seemed to me to be really quite foolish. And, and I and, and I've occasionally would drive by in some city and see this really little dumpy Jackson Hewitt tax office and said, what a joke that is. And then I remember reading this release that how Jackson and Hewitt had just been sold for $480 million in cash. Um, and I get, wow, how did they do that? And, and it was off of revenues of $31.4 million. That's a small company. And, and income from operations, which didn't mean bottom line, income from operations of uh, $11.8 million. Uh, they had done approximately 875,000 tax returns the year they were sold. H&R Block that same year probably did about 16 million. But they had built a number two that was growing, that was thriving, it was small, and they got someone to come along and pay them almost $500 million for it. Um, another story like that is a friend of mine also from Cleveland who I remember him coming to me one day and telling me about how he had this idea to start a company which became Office Max. And what was interesting about the, this was he said, you know, there are three or four companies already out there, you know, Office Depot or Staples. I don't remember the exact names of them. But it was the, the, the big box concept of a huge, you know, location where all of your needs would be there, you know, lots of inventory. And I'm thinking to myself, how can you be the third or fourth entry in there and possibly win in that marketplace? It just made no sense. Now, this was a very successful entrepreneur. This, too, was going to be his second or third deal, and he'd, he'd been fabulously successful. And it turned out I think I was the only person I knew in Cleveland, Ohio, that did not invest in Bob Hurwitz's Office Max. I just didn't get how you could be the fourth entry. I had a friend who put a million bucks into Office Max. I could not imagine why he did that. And like three years later, he got $11 million back when they sold it to Kmart. It was just unbelievable to me. So again, faster, better. This guy, Bob Hurwitz, was an execution genius. That's what, he would actually go and walk through these states, spend hours at the Staples or the Office Depots, and he'd figure out everything they were doing wrong. And as an operator, between sourcing and inventory management and sales, he just knew I can operate it better and build a more successful business, and by God, he did. Um, now, needless to say, whereas it's obvious Brave New World fails more often than it succeeds, you know, follow the leader doesn't always work either. Uh, Jackson Hewitt figured out how to do it. Beneficial, Beneficial was a company that had all these locations around the country that, was, that did loans. You know, sort of for middle and lower income people, they would, do, they would do loans to you. And they went into the tax service business, and they tried for years and years and years. They never got to more than 200,000 tax returns, and they finally closed down the service. They couldn't figure out how to compete uh, with H&R Block. And as an aside, I'll tell you, my friend Bob Hurwitz, uh, he went on after selling Office Max. He stayed retired for, you know, 18 months or however long he could play golf. And he then went on to his next gig. And his next gig was a company called Home Place. Same thing. Third or fourth entrant. You know, there was Bed Bath & Beyond already, and there was this one already. And that he was going to be the third or fourth entrant. But he, 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 he was, you know, he was convinced that I can operate this better and build a massively successful business. And I was not going to be the only person in Cleveland, Ohio, to not invest in Home Place. And so I sunk my half a million dollars in it and lost every penny. <laughs> Bob's still my friend, though. Um, the message here, there is one. Remember, universal principles, these aren't just stories, right? The message here is that execution counts. Um, it, it counts in every aspect, in the marketing, kind of developing the marketing plan, and the value concept, what's the value proposition to consumers, and the pricing policy, and, of course, most importantly, and something not on topic today, in operations. You can have the best business opportunity in the world, and the operations will kill it if not done well. Um, now, I should tell you that when I started High Legal Services, I didn't know any of that. I actually believed the key challenge, like most young entrepreneurs or old entrepreneurs, like most first-time entrepreneurs, I believed the key challenge was to validate the concept. That's what most entrepreneurs think. If I can validate the concept, hey, we'll just perfect this little black box and roll this sucker out. It's going to be easy. Um, well, I will tell you that, that validating the concept was the easy part. I mean, it was necessary to be sure, but woefully insufficient. And why do I say it was the easy part? I think we validated the concept in the first week. We started putting some ads on for Hyatt Legal Services and it blew the switchboards out. We had people, you know, we had started with four little offices in Cleveland, Ohio, and people were standing outside trying to get in. I mean, there was no question that there was an unmet marketing need, no question we could provide the information about cost and availability, no question we could get customers, and that was all the easy part. I thought that was the brilliance. We're home free. Um, it, it, uh, it, it doesn't work that way. Um, uh, I don't want to admit to you how many years we spent trying to get the bottom 50 performing offices 
to perform like the top 50 performing offices. That's all about operations and execution, and it's the hard part of building a business. Um, and I think that's particularly true with, with technology companies where you have to execute fast and well by continually adapting to what you're learning in the marketplace. If you're not first in the technology area, you better be best. Uh, those are the only two ways you can see, succeed in the technology. Either be first or be best. You, the, 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 the follow the leader part there is, if you're going to follow the leader, it's because you're going to build a better mousetrap really quickly. Now, I'll mention three other notions about identifying entrepreneurial opportunities, and then, as promised, turn it over to, to you for conversation. Uh, the first is, is something that happens here in Silicon Valley a lot, much more so than anywhere else, frankly. Uh, but it's the concept of, of, of starting a company to sell it to a predetermined target. Now, there are good cycles for doing this and bad. When I was teaching here, it was a terrific cycle. You could, uh, you could draw something up on a napkin and have a chance Cisco would buy it. Um, it's not quite as easy anymore. But the point is you can design a company to be bought by Cisco. You can design a company to be bought by Intuit. I mean, you can understand a large conglomerate's place in the market and try to find a product offering they don't have. And then all you have to do is validate technology and or market and sell the company. In the meantime, you outsource as much as you can. You stay lean and mean. And you have a, your idea is to validate something for someone else to worry about execution. Um, the second is because, and I'm trying to address now, because what I, the question I got the most, uh, and I see my colleague, my former colleague when I was here, Dennis Rowan here, and the question that, that guys like Dennis and I would get the most is, how, I, you know, I want to be an entrepreneur, but I don't have an idea. And so how do I find an idea? And, 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 I'm, and I've always tried to help answer that question. Another way to find an idea is to, um, is to understand that lots of industries are clustered. This was an insight that Michael Porter of Harvard Business School spent a lot of time developing. You know, if you're interested in wine, there are a couple places in the world you can go to and all the wine, you know, California's Napa and Sonoma Counties, for example, that's the wine industry of the United States. If you're interested in leather or fashion, you know, there are pockets of that in Italy that account for 60% of the whole world's market. If you're interested in, in home furnishings, there's Grand Rapids, Michigan. If you're interested in medical devices, there's a, there, there's a, a section of Massachusetts that's got the, you know, the lion's share of medical device business in the world. The point here is if you find an industry that you're interested in, and you go to the cluster that is the, that is the center of that industry, and you get yourself working in that industry open-minded about perceiving what's the next niche and ready to seize that opportunity when you formulate it. And the final notion I make is simply a general application of that specific cluster idea, and it is what I call contextual knowledge. Most entrepreneurial opportunities come out of contextual knowledge. And what I be mean by that is putting yourself in a space, in an area, in a sector that you enjoy and that you care about, and starting to learn all you can by working in that sector, keeping your eyes and your brain open to perceiving an opportunity, and then being ready to jump to seize it. And contextual knowledge is, is, is underlies almost all identification of entrepreneurial opportunities. Um, with that, I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions uh, that you might have. Sir. Yeah. Jacoby Myers um, is a, was a firm like Hyatt Legal Services, started uh, actually before we did in Los Angeles. Um, th they, they thought that the way to conquer the world was to conquer Los Angeles and New York. Uh, we thought the way to conquer the world was to stay out of Los Angeles and New York, and it turned out we were right. So we were in 16 of the largest 20 metropolitan areas in the country. Uh, they were in two, in, the, in two of the four we weren't in. Um, they're still around, um, but they never they never grew out of their Los Angeles, New York base, and they're pretty they're much actually smaller than they were in those days. And neither Jacoby nor Myers is involved with them, so it's. Uh, they, they they you know they never moved into the legal plans business. They sort of had a different a different approach. Yes. Yeah, that's a great question, and at the beginning we did it totally by trial and error, with heavy emphasis on the error part of that. 
Um, and over time, that proved to be our principal competitive advantage, which was the database. It became for us an actuarial science, just like it is in all insurance businesses. We knew on average exactly what it cost to deliver a high quality will. We knew on average. Now, averages matter to us. If you only do, if you're doing, you know, uh, six divorces a year, there's no point trying to average them. You could get killed on one. One could take nine months. It could be a long, drawn out, horrible affair, and the other could take nine days. How are you going to price that? But if you're doing thousands, it's different. So, on any individual case, we might actually lose a lot of money or make far more than we should have made. But the fact that it cost $675 made everybody happy. And what we built was a database. It became such a science, and it, and it was really true in the Hyatt Legal Plans arena. We could go into a company and, 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 and uh, survey its workforce by you know, uh, socioeconomic characteristic. We knew exactly how many wills we'd write in a year. We knew exactly how many divorces we'd handle. We knew exactly how many home closing. And we knew the cost, on average, of doing every one of those. It, we priced those plans to a science. We could meet with a company and two days later give them a quote and we would have, we would know what our administrative cost is, our cost of delivery, what our profit was, and we never missed after, after a few years of building the database. And we, and we're the only people in the world with that database. That was a huge competitive advantage. And, and the, so the pricing became, as I say, uh, an enormous science for us. And because we concentrated on being the high quality provider, here's the other insight we had. Once we got into PepsiCo, PepsiCo, you know, all they cared about is if this, pro if this program is a hassle to us, we are, we are not interested. If it's an administrative hassle, we're not interested. And if we start hearing from our employees' complaints, we're, it's over. Well, and, 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 and so we structured everything about on the administrative side to be not, not like any of their insurance programs, all of which were a hassle. And we did all the administration ourselves and made it really easy for the employee benefits department. And then we incented our attorney providers the standard fees that we would pay them for delivering the service typically were better than what they had, had computed themselves sort of on average they were getting. We incented them to do a great job. Here's what we wanted. When a PepsiCo employee walked into some law firm in, in Peoria, Illinois, we wanted to make sure that law firm paid real attention, communicated clearly. If they said the wills would be done next Tuesday, it was done. And we paid pretty well because here's what we learned. Other providers would go into PepsiCo and say, you're spending, you know, your employees are paying $14 a month for the, you're paying, they, they would say to PepsiCo, you're paying. It really wasn't true. PepsiCo thought of it as the employee paying it. But you're paying $14 a month for a legal plan, and we'll do it for $8. You know, we still have PepsiCo today. The plans, we've been there 20 years. And the reason is they get no complaints from their employees, and they have no administrative hassle. And when we've needed to raise fees, they raise them without even asking. Now, keep in mind, 14 bucks, the medical plan is probably 340 bucks. I mean, there's no, you know, so to them it was all cheap anyway. And what we realized is we should be the high quality provider, charge what we have to charge to deliver a great product, because PepsiCo's not going to throw us out for an $8 plan that's going to create problems for them. So that was the strategy all on. But the pricing issue is a, a very important issue. In the first few years, I mean, you know, we'd say it was, you know, $50 for a will, and it took us two years to figure out we were losing money on every will we were writing. So, I mean, we, we really had to be, we, w the smart thing we did from day one is start capturing the data. It took us quite a while to figure out how to make sense of the data. But over time, that was the principal competitive advantage we had. We were the only people providing legal services in the whole country that actually understood cost. Yeah, well, that's a, it, it's a separate speech, I, which I would have loved to have given, but I didn't have the outline written yet. Um, <laughs> you know, a current TV is, um, it's a real hybrid uh, in, in every respect. In, it's a hybrid between Brave New World and uh, Better, Faster, Cheaper. Um, it started in a conversation between Al and me about trying to develop um, uh, a new national, hopefully global news service that would be delivered through the Internet with all kinds of customizable and personalizable and localizable bells and whistles. And then we reached a conclusion that great as that idea was and cool as it was, there was no, there was no business model. There was just no way we could turn that into an economically viable enterprise. And, and we concluded we didn't want to do it as a not-for-profit for all a host of reasons I don't want to take time to get into. Um, and so what we did there is, is we approached the whole question differently, which was, you know, we wanted to be in the media business. Why don't we study the media business to see what are the tried and true business models within the media industry? And by the way, there are a few. 
We, we happened along the cable satellite television model. It's an incredible business model. It has two revenue streams. You get, you get paid for the content by the distributors, by the, by the Comcast and the DirecTVs, and you get advertising revenues by the advertisers. You know, typically these companies operate with 50% uh, margins, and today, as, as for the last 20 years, their value in the marketplace at 30 times EBITDA. You know, I looked at that, I said, gosh, you know, I sold my company to uh, MetLife for seven times EBITDA, and I thought I was a hero. And by the way, it worked out fine, I got no complaints. But here's this industry that's 30 times EBITDA, what a great industry. So we changed the, the, we changed the exploration to be, why don't we take that business model and bring to it massive doses of innovation instead of innovate on the business model, which may or may not work. So we, we, that's how we came to the cable satellite. Now, everyone we asked, Al and I spent over four years before we launched this thing, everyone we asked said it was impossible. Well, as an old-fashioned entrepreneur, that just got my juices going, oh, nothing's impossible, I don't hear about that. Now, because Al and I were outsiders and didn't know anything about the industry, we actually didn't know they were all correct. It is impossible. You, you, can't, you can't start a cable satellite television. You can't because it is a totally closed industry controlled by a handful of conglomerates Public policy allows the Comcast of the world to not only, through government grant and monopolies, control the pipe into your home. One out of every five homes that have cable in the United States is a Comcast government grant and monopoly. They, they don't compete with other cable companies in their cities. And not only can they control the pipe to your home, but public policy lets them control the content that flows through that pipe. They can even own the content that flows through that pipe. And now that they figured out, they kept sort of testing the limits of public policy. They learned there are no limits. And now they, own, you know, they will not deal with an independent network. Why should they pay somebody for content? They can own the content. So it turns out it is impossible. Um, Al and I finessed that again. Same sort of, well, if you can't start to know, is there something you can buy? And, uh, and we bought a little network. Um, is this off the record? They're pressing on. I'm not going to. Okay, camera. Um, we bought a little network. Um, we bought it from a French company. And I'll just leave it at that. Because if you look at transactions in the United States, you'll find out that this handful of conglomerates only transact with each other. Um, we bought it from a French company. Vivendi Universal was selling all of its media properties, and they sold all of them in one auction to NBC for $14 billion. But we talked them into spinning out this tiny little network, and they sold it to us. It was at the time called News World International. And that gave us a beachhead. That gave us access, carriage, distribution into 17 million US households. And we thought that was a sufficient platform to bring our vision of innovation and the core, the, the core innovations uh, that we were always planning to do and are now executing are, are, are that about 30% of what you see on current TV is viewer created content. It's content that comes to us from our viewers. It's never been done in television before. And the other innovation, of course, is the intersection between television and the internet. The internet is a very important part of our production infrastructure. The way in which we get that content from our viewers is through the internet. And if you're not a producer of content, you can still help us program the network by coming to the on, on, on to, into our online studio and reviewing videos that have been submitted by people and voting on them and green lighting them and the very best end up on air. So it's a very interactive, it's, it, it's, a, it's a deep engagement with the audience that's never been done in television. Again, this is a whole different speech and I, I, I want to try to be a little disciplined to not give it. Um, but the point is, um, it, it, it's, um, um, it, it is truly entrepreneurial but off of a different kind of model. It's, it's, it's knowing when to sort of do something different and back up and try to do something that there's a, there's, a, there's a pathway that you can understand and we're mixing and matching them. And, and I'll say that um, it's been a blast and it's going great. I mean, I, I, I like doing things that are uh, new and different. It keeps me learning and this one's particularly good because our audience is all about young adults and our, Al and I are the only old people in the company. The entire team's young adults. So. That's kind of cool. In fact, Al came up to me after, after an event we did in Central Park at, um, in New York City, and some of our kids were there who were all in our target demographic, my, my sons and his kids. And he came over to me, he put his arm around me, he said, can you believe that our kids think we're cool? I mean, it was really, it was really, you know, really a great moment. Um, so we're, we, we're, we're having a lot of fun and we're growing. And I will tell you, like, like a lot of entrepreneurs think, some things haven't been at all like we planned, and other things uh, have been. Uh, some, you know, both good and both bad. We are right now in serious uh, negotiation to have current carried all over the world. This wasn't even in our business plan. Never wasn't in our business plan f at all. We just figured, hey, it's good. You know, if we ever get to be a successful U.S. network, maybe we'll be able to distribute abroad. But before this year's out, I'm pretty sure current will be available in the United Kingdom, in Ireland, in France, uh, perhaps Italy, perhaps Germany, and, and in the next couple of years, we're going to see it all over the world. So it's it's very exciting. That's why I like being an entrepreneur. Yeah. So,
Well, I don't want to claim um, I, I don't want to claim any better insight uh, than you would have. Um, I, I do think that you know my own personal opinion is that the debate over globalization is it good? Is it bad? Uh, is it in the interest of the United States? Is it in the interest of developing? Because I, I find the debate a complete waste of time and foolish. Globalization is a reality. It's like you know the genie coming out of the bottle. It is not going back in the bottle. Um, in, and, 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 and frankly, my new business is a perfect example. We spent untold you know, hours and months on a business plan. Uh, some of the best brains in the world, you know, we thought, you know, applied. To, there wasn't a sentence in it about current anywhere else in the world. And we launch on August 1st of 2005, just, you know, a handful of months ago. And here we are all, with teams all over the world right now getting current distributed. The in internationalization, globalization is a fact of life. And you ought to think about your entrepreneurial opportunity in that context. It means far more markets and far more consumers. It couldn't be more exciting. It, you know, again, I have a bias. I mean, you know, I, I remember it, while here, I started sitting in on, um, uh, no, help me, the great, uh, he's a good friend of mine, the, uh, the, the great um, economist who's here, um, who does macro. One of your students, help me. Say it again. Paul yeah, thanks, Paul Romer. Thank you. So I, I asked Paul if I could sit in his classes because I wanted to learn something about, you know, macro, and I did, and it was, a, and if you haven't taken his course, you should, you'll learn a lot. And, um, and I remember going up to him after class one day and chatting with him about, you know, this whole notion about um, trade and protectionism. You know, we go in, in this country through these cycles of, of protectionist instincts and what have you. And, and I phrased the question to him in the context of the impact on the United States of, of the, what was then a, another one of those cycles of movement toward protectionist policies. And Paul made a very interesting comment. He said, you know, he said, uh, you know, my concern really isn't with what's going to happen in the United States if we move in that direction. You know, the United States is going to do fine one way or the other. He said, but you know, to the developing countries, you know, you absolutely, you, you absolutely seal off the chance for them to raise their standards of living. It's only through global trade that that's going to happen. And I think it's a profound comment, and it's an obvious point, and any econ economist will tell it to you. I mean, it's a win-win. There are there are transition losses. And we, we, we face transition losses, and I think you have to take very, very seriously the people caught in the transition loss, and you've got to address that, and you've got to help that. Uh, but there's no question that globalization is a, is, is, is a, is a net positive worldwide. No, I'm, I'm not so sure well, if I knew the answer to your question, I would have answered that. But since I didn't, I gave a speech on something else. <laughs> Say that again. Well, you know, that's if I understand the question, I'm not sure that I do. Um, you know, the, the, the business I'm involved in now is premised on the fact that you can unleash the creative talents of people all over the world and use those talents productively in a new business model for how to unleash, capture, reward that that's not being used. And, and by the way, that also, not only was, it, was, was what, what we're doing at Current TV viewed as impossible because of the current state of the industry structure, that you're just not going to have any more independent television networks. And you're not, until public policy changes, you're not. Uh, but it was also viewed as impossible creatively. I mean, what we were talking about doing was viewed, you know, if you'd ask anybody in the television or entertainment industry or media industry on July 30th of, of 05, you know, what about these guys are going to launch this current TV based on viewer-created content? You would have been told it's a joke. I mean, it's, and, and you, I mean, we heard it all the time. It's a joke. And here's why. Because here's what they said. They said, we spend millions of dollars on the most talented people in the world. And you know what happens every year in Hollywood? They produce all these new television series ideas, and statistically, all of them fail. 
I mean, once, once you're round in the right direction. I mean, you follow it yourself. NBC launches 12 new series, one of them maybe makes it. Others are canceled on the second show and on the fourth. And I would watch this stuff and go, what the hell kind of business is this? They spend all these millions of dollars to, to, to produce 13 episodes, and on the second episode, they're canceling it? I mean, my God. But to them, that was, and so here was their take. Their take was, here's how, that's how we do it. Millions of dollars to the smartest, most creative people in the world, and most fail. And these clowns think John Q. Citizen is going to create content. Can you believe it? Well, that was July 30th. If you ask the leading content players in the industry today about viewer-created content, which is a, we invented the term and we're the only people doing it, the entire industry is now, is now moving in the highest possible gear to do what we're doing. MTV just reorganized the entire corporate headquarters into a short form, we, we created it, into you know, user-generated content, that's the industry term. We're changing that to viewer-created and they're following us because it's an ugly term, user-generated content. Um, the, you know, uh, industry, you know, every one of those companies, same people July 30 said it's stupid, we're four or five months later and they're all figuring out how to catch up. And what have we done? We've taken just a germ of an idea. There's enormous talent out there, young adults who understand how to use the modern tools of the digital age. They know how to use Final Cut Pro. They're incredible videographers. They're out there telling real stories about real people that really resonate, that are compelling, that are riveting. CBS doesn't talk to those people. You can't, they can't walk in the door and say, I got a piece of video for you. We're the only place they can do that. And by the way, while we're the only place, it's unbelievable the stuff that we get. And then our other insight, of course, is we don't, it doesn't go from viewer to the air. We then add some value in the middle with some really world-class producers and editors and what have you, and you end up with an amazing product that, as I say, in just three or four months, the industry said, oh my goodness, there's another creative model to be used. I think this is going to be distributed distributed um, uh, uh, creativity structured through new organizing principles and business models, I believe it's going to be a very big part of, of the future. And we see this already, and in, in globalization plays a big part in that, too. I'm not sure that was the answer to your question either. But. Many of the speakers here today have done internal activities, either here in the Silicon Valley, uh, around this area. So for most of the people who come in and talk about entrepreneurship at the business school are doing it here. You did your entrepreneurship in an area not necessarily known for it. Any takeaways from your Yeah, wow, that's a great question. Um, uh, that's a great question. I mean, I, I love being here precisely because of the entrepreneurial spirit of the place and because um, entrepreneurship in, 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 in certain locations like Silicon Valley um, is much easier to do um, because of, of the many resources available Including, you know, including other entrepreneurs to help you do it. I mean, I, you know, in, in Cleveland, Ohio, I was an entrepreneur, and once every few years, someone would come to me with an idea they had for an entrepreneurial endeavor. Um, I came out here, and someone came to me every day. It was like, whoa! I mean, it was, I could, it was unbelievable. And so to me, that was really so exciting. And there's a meritocracy of ideas that exists in a place like this that is hugely motivational. I mean, best ideas went on, and it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't really matter who you know, it's the power of the idea and the, and the strength of your character and determination and, and persistence. And, and uh, you know, it, there, there is something in a culture in a place like this that breeds that that I think is enormously useful. I mean, do entrepreneur ideas sprout up uh, anywhere? Of course they do. Uh, but I found, that, you know, what I, how I used to explain it to people is that there, there, there are, are wonderful, interesting, high-quality people anywhere in the world. You could find them in Toledo, Ohio. But what you have out here is what I call, you know, it's the quantity of the quality. What amazed me in my, you know, in my first few years here is that I'd never go a week without meeting a person like that. Uh, it takes a greater effort in Toledo or Cleveland, or, you know. And so there are, there are real differences. Uh, there are real differences. I think some, some community, I think Cleveland's an example, that are struggling are struggling precisely because of how difficult it is to do something new. And, uh, and, and growth, you know, whether it's entrepreneurial growth of starting companies or whether it's, it's the growth internally and big. See, one of the reasons we teach entrepreneurship here is because the principles matter in large companies too. I mean, the principles are, are the same. They're actually harder to do in large companies, but every bit is important. Economic growth is about creating, creating new value. And, uh, and this is a much better place to do that. And the pockets of the world like this uh, 
mean, if that's what you want to do, you're probably better off being in a pocket like this. You're going to bump into those, you're going to bump into and be able to access the resources necessary much more easily here. And, and by the way, the other big thing is there's not a stigma to failure. You know, in, in Cleveland, Ohio, you start a company, in many parts of the world, by the way, one, one of the reasons lots of countries, lots of societies are so non-entrepreneurial is because of the stigma of failure. You know, you don't go to a, a, an existing large company or to the government ministries or what have you, but you start a business. If you fail, you're just a failure, and that's what you're tagged as being. You know, out here, if you fail, everybody assumes, okay, you got all the learning you needed, and, and now you're going to make it big on the second try. I mean, the cultural difference is enormous. I mean, just enormous. Yeah, good question. Yeah, no, no, really, really, it's a good question. Because um, you're right. I mean, in any new idea, you're going to get lots of naysayers. Like I did in talking to 50 lawyers, every one of whom told me it was a bad idea. That does not mean you shouldn't do due diligence. Um, it, you know, there are, probably, there are probably 18 or so, there were when I left, 18 or so entrepreneurship courses being taught here at the business school. And if I were to sum, in, uh, sum, sum them all into, into, into one minute summary of what they all try to teach, it's essentially this. Um, not every good idea is a good business. What your due diligence needs to do is to try to figure out whether this good idea, of which there are lots, would also be a good business. Now, what's the difference? I'll give you that in, in practically a sentence, too. Uh, a good business, as opposed to a good idea, a good business is when there is an identifiable customer who will pay you for your product or service a price which at the end of the day allows you to generate a profit. Now, that may have just sounded like I said it's five minutes to noon. Okay, what's the profundity in that? Okay, but I will tell you that every, just about every course here, that's what it's about. The difference between a good idea and a good business, I'll say it again, is a good business is when there's an identifiable customer who will pay you a price for your product or service, which at the end of the day generates a profit. Now, let me tell you why that's actually a very profound thing, because when I started teaching here at Stanford Business School, no one agreed with me. And that goes to my having been a old-fashioned entrepreneur in a non-technology business in a, in, in a dying part of the country. And I came out here in the tech go-go days. And I found out that, by the way, customers didn't mean anything. It was about eyeballs. And, and, by the way, if you had eyeballs, that's all you needed because here was the mantra of the day. The mantra was, we'll figure out how to monetize it later. <laughs> and so I couldn't let on to any of my colleagues that I'm teaching in this place. I just couldn't let them know. Look, I don't get anything they're talking about. <laughs> I mean, to me, if a customer shows up and doesn't buy something and leaves without buying, that's like, that's like criminal. That's the worst thing that can happen in a business. And all of my students and all of my fellow faculty, they were all in love with businesses where people showed up all the time and left without paying anything. And they were going to figure out how to monetize that later. Why? By the way, why? Because there were two or three companies that Microsoft bought, you know, that they figured out they were, by the way, in almost every one of those instances, Microsoft did not figure out how to monetize it later. But that's a different story. You know, the, the entrepreneur started this little idea, had lots of eyeballs, had no revenues, and Microsoft paid $400 million. So the entire business school was trying to follow that model. And I staked out a claim early on in the heyday of that that it made no sense. And it took a few years before, you know, I, I, I'll tell you my favorite story. It's speaking out of school here, Dennis, but, 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 but my mentor, Chuck Holloway, absolutely beautiful human, bank, human being and one of the smartest guys here. And if you haven't taken any of Chuck's courses, do so. Um, you know, he and John Morgridge, I think still the chairman, uh, previously CEO of, of Cisco, they were co-teaching the same course that I was teaching. I should say that differently. I was teaching the same course that Chuck had developed and he and John were teaching. Um, and, I, and so we piggybacked a lot on the, on the cases and on the guests. And they had written a new case about an acquisition that Cisco had made. They'd paid $8 billion for this little startup company that had no revenues and no earning. And the, and the, and the purpose of the case, the, the principle of the case, was about valuation methodology. 
And Chuck had sent the case over with a note, let me know if you want to teach this next term, and I'll arrange for the guests you know, for the same day that, you know, for, for our course. And I, I didn't get back to Chuck after a couple of weeks, and he stopped me in the hall one day. He said, you know, you can get back to me. You want to do that case? I need to know whether to book the guests for you as well as for John and me. I said, no, thanks, Chuck. I'm not going to teach that case. And, and you know, the, the, um, the methodology here is fresh cases are really important. Students don't want cases that are 10 years old. They want cases that are 10 days old. And it's very important to innovate on cases. And turning down a new case was, you know. So Chuck said, why won't you teach that case? I said, Chuck, the case is about valuation methodology. Cisco paid $8 billion for Ether. I can't teach that. I don't understand it. Now, you know, back then, everybody understood it but me. Now, of course, those days are all over. And the point is, the point is, there are universal principles associated with creating value that you ignore at your peril. 